Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at rating scale models. Okay, so remember, in another video, we were looking at race models. Okay, so in that situation, we had like students taking a test, and all the questions on the test, the response was either could be coded as a zero or a one. Zero for incorrect, one for correct. All right, so we want to take this a step further in that we want to have questions where they could get an integer value uh, score. So zero, one, two, or maybe zero, one, two, three, four, five, and, and so on. So in the race model, all questions were zero, one. Here, we're extending that to ordinal, where we can represent them with zero, one, two, and so on. Uh, that all questions have to have the same like integer values. So if one question has a possible value of five, all questions have to have a possible value of five and we'll be looking at the situation of different distributions going from zero to five okay so when i'm working with ordinal data data that's not an integer it needs to be coded as an integer value and and more specifically we need to have it start at zero all right so zero will be the lowest score and the highest value will be the greatest integer value all the questions have to have the same number of levels and also there's an assumption of constant threshold difference okay i'll talk about that later a major disadvantage of the range scale model is that we have to have all the assumptions of a race model okay so in the race model we had uh, we had three different assumptions that had to be correct for us to be having uh, to be able to trust this model remember with assumptions we never truly know if it's correct we can check to see if it smells right but we never truly know and anytime i'm dealing with data i never truly know what's going on otherwise i wouldn't be using data okay so let's go ahead and work on an example in this example we're going to use the children's empathic attitude questionnaire and this is from the m psycho r package and it's a scale to measure empathy in late elementary and middle school age children there are 16 questions and there are three covariates included in the data set age grade and gender and so we can see the questions and for us they're going to be scored either zero one or two okay and this is going to be ordinal because we don't truly know like if one kid is a zero another kid is a one we don't know what their criteria is what their threshold for crossing over is so it's, this is ordinal data now, in this data set, we have some missing values on age, grade, and gender. All right, I'm going to go ahead and impute those, and then we're going to be doing hypothesis testing. Now, something to always be mindful of if I'm doing something for like a research journal, I need to be mindful will they accept an imputed uh, data results? All right, so we're loading the data set. It's CEAQ from the M Psycho R package. Now I'm going to go ahead and impute the data. Now I'm going to be using uh, uh, a ranger package to do the imputation I'm using the miss ranger package. Yeah, I feel like this works very well for it performs very well in a lot of situations. Now if I look through the data, the ones that are, are missing are age, grade, and gender. Now, if you know something about education, if I have uh, you know, students with special needs, there, it's possible, or maybe language barrier issues, it's possible for some of the like CEAQ uh, values to be very different than uh, students of the same grade and same age. So in my imputation, I'm imputing age based off of grade and I'm imputing grade off of age initially. And so here what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to fill in just those two using each other because I know that there's a correspondence. Now, if a kid was accelerated or held back and I impute that value, I'm gonna be off, but I'm probably not gonna be off by, by a whole heck of a lot. Also, you know, kids that are on the borderline for their, you know, they're very old for their grade or very young for their, their grade, you know, it can be thrown off, but I feel like this is the best way to go. If I was to include the items from the emotion asset, emotional assessment, 
then what could happen is for kids who had trouble understanding the question and kids that had special needs, uh, they it could or or language barrier, it could just be completely thrown off. So I don't want so something that could look like it's good uh, could give me bad imputation. And from subject matter knowledge, I know to do this. Now after I've done that. So I'm still going to have missing values inside age and grade. So I'm looking at this and there's going to be still some times that age and grade are missing on both of them. And I still have gender to take care of. So I go ahead and I just run Miss Ranger on the whole thing. So now I'm letting all the data be involved in imputing uh, the remaining missing values. There aren't very many at this point, but they are present. Uh, this may not be the best choice, uh, depending on what's going on, um, depending on who my audience is. I could do it like for now, preliminary, and then you know proceed forward, and then you know go back and you know delete that code if it looks like that wouldn't be accepted. All right, so now I, what I want to do, I want to fit a rating scale model. Now I'm going to say call this the full model. Because in a moment, I'm going to go through, I'm going to reduce it down. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to take the data, and I'm going to subtract one from all this, because the raw data has one as the minimum value. I need to have zero as the minimum value, otherwise this isn't going to make sense. All right, and then we just go to the ERM package, rating scale model, and we just drop the data straight in. It's very nice. The ERM package, you know, we pretty much just give it and it runs it, it figures it out for us. All right, so now what I want to do, I want to extract the person parameters, and then I want to get the item fit off of the person parameters, and then I want to take a look at what does it look like? What, you know, check to see, do I have a good model or not? All right, so what I'm going to focus in on right now is the p-values. So look through here, not statistically significant, not significant. Oh, three, looking at three. Then going down the list, 10. Oh, 10, this one is hopping out at me. Right there. Then that's kind of close, but I, we'll call that okay. And then we see 15. Okay, so now I have to make it a choice. Depending on my project, it might be, you know, uh, worthwhile to go through and remove items for the purpose of this analysis. So what this type of model assumes is that there is one latent variable under the hood that we can't directly observe that's driving the results on all of these other questions. Now, if my goal is to get the best estimate of that value possible, it might be uh, prudent to go through and reduce down this model by removing uh, items. I might also want to go through and remove uh, individual students if I feel like they are substantially different from the rest of the population. Um, you know, so if, if there are students, let's say, that had a horrible head trauma and they're taking this test, well, you know, putting them in the same pool as the rest of the population, you know, may not be a wise choice. So. I have to make decisions on what to do from here to improve my model. That might be acceptable, that might not be, depending on my purpose. If I was using this for the purpose of, let's say like human resources, so similar to what like the state of Florida does for evaluating uh, uh, students, uh, you know, success and failure on uh, promotion to the next grade and on teacher bonuses, teacher uh, retention and uh, you know, unfavorable actions against teachers, I can't go through and start tinkering with stuff willy-nilly as I choose. And in that case, I would just leave everything and just proceed as uh, to go because I need to be able to legally in a courtroom defend my model. Uh, here, I'm, you know, because I'm making the, you know, it, if, if I don't reduce it down, we're, there's not gonna be much to talk about in this video. So we're gonna go ahead and reduce it down. So I'm gonna go through and I'm going to remove 10. Now, what I would do, in this process, I would remove one item, run the rerun the model, check to see, and if there are anything anything I should remove, I'll remove one item, rerun the model. I'll keep on doing this. Now, my personal experience on model fitting, it's okay to have one item that's kind of, that's not going the way you want it to. That's okay. Uh, the reason why I say it's okay to have one is because a lot of times it's just too hard 
to get uh, a, you know a model the way you want it without without throwing too much out. So to give a little bit of give, I personally once I get one that is statistically significant, I would just stop. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and remove question ten, and then I'm going to rerun the model without it. And so now I look through here. All right, this is statistically significant. Statistically significant. Keep on going. Keep on going. And statistically significant. Okay. So. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and remove those. So what I did before I made the video, I went one at a time, remove an item, reduce it, remove an item, re, you know, rebuild the model, remove an item until I felt comfortable. And so in, in the actual process, remove them one at a time, but for the purpose of the video, I'm just going to cut out all of these all at one shot. And if I look down the list now, you'll notice that the p-values have changed. Here we go. 14 is statistically significant. It was statistically significant then, but it wasn't a very big value. It was, it was close. But I'm going to go ahead and just leave it as is. All right, so now here is my chi-squared statistic that's used to get, and along with the degrees of freedom, to get the p-value. We have our outfit. Uh, mean squares. We have our infit mean squares. All right, we have our t value, uh, alpha, alpha and infit t value, and then our discrimination parameter. And this is similar to the discrimination parameter from a race model. All right, so now what I want to do, I want to check to see if I have a good model fit using the Anderson likelihood ratio test. The idea here is if I can grab a covariate that is not part of the model and I get statistically significant difference between the two groups, then I can go, hey, I have a bad model because it's not detecting everything. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna break it up into elementary and middle. If I can detect a difference based off the elementary or middle, then there's gonna be a, there's gonna be a problem. And so here, I don't see, it does not look like, it, so it looks like the model fit, you know, well enough. All right, so now let's take a look at the cutoffs. Okay, so here we're assuming that there is an under the hood latent variable that's driving the values that we see on the actual questionnaire. Okay, so we're assuming that there's one latent variable and for students that are very, like a very low, low value, uh, large negative value, we would expect for them to have zero on an individual item. If a student has a very, very large positive value of the latent variable, we would expect them to have uh, a uh, two on this one. So what's going on is for question one, if a student's latent variable is, is less than negative 1.03, we think that they are most likely to get a zero. If their latent variable is larger than 0.43, we they are we are modeled most likely to get two, and if it's in between, we expect them to get a one. So here is the threshold to go from this column is the threshold to go from zero to one. So less than this value here, we less than here we expect them to get a zero. This is this column is the model threshold to go from one to two. So if they're greater than this value, we expect for them to get a two, or they're most like modeled to be most likely to get it. And then if they have a uh, latent variable in between the two values, we expect them to get a one. Okay. Now look at those numbers. Look at the difference in those values. Do you see anything about them? Do you notice that? If I go through and start doing subtraction between them, can I get like a consistent value, maybe, maybe? All right, this is, when I bring this up, I'm talking about that constant uh, threshold difference assumption. All right, so if we go through and we do the subtraction on the threshold. So here I take the threshold to go from one to two. Here's the threshold to go from zero to one. If I take the difference, I see that we have a constant value of 1.5. And this is across all questions. Okay, so 
you know, the, what this means. So the part of the model fitting for this uh, model structure is that we are assuming that there is a constant difference in the, the uh, thresholds. It's just what's the difference is how far left and right are the, the entire like distributions. And this indicates, this location column indicates how far left or right the distributions are. Now let's take a look at those distributions. All right, so here we're just taking a look at question one. And here is the under the hood latent variable along this axis. And here's the probability. And we can see that if the, so if, if we saw that the student had a zero on question one, here is our modeled probability distribution of their latent variable. And we're gonna call that empathy. Now, if the student has a one on question one, then here is the conditional probability distribution of their empathy latent variable. If the student has a, a two on question one, here is the conditional probability distribution of their empathy core score. Okay, so if I know what value, so under the assumption that they are one, two, or three, I have a probability distribution of what their empathy level is. Okay, well, let's go another way with this. So this is, so I, what I said is just from the test score to the latent variable, what about latent variable to the test score? Okay, so if I know that the person has a negative two empathy, I can see that this is the modeled likelihood that they would get a two, modeled likelihood of a one, modeled likelihood of a zero. So I can see that zero is most likely. All right, now what if they have a middle value, let's say they have a zero for their uh, empathy value. Here is the modeled likelihood of a zero, modeled likelihood of a two, modeled likelihood of a one. We can see that in this range here, they're most likely to get a one. And similarly, if we see that a, a student has an empathy score, a latent variable under the hood, greater than this cutoff, they are most likely to get a two. Okay, so one of the big things about this model structure is that the lateral distance from here to here is constant for every single question in the model fitting process. If this is a bad assumption, that you should not use this type of model unless the other types of models available don't fit for other reasons. And we can go through and we can look at it. And so we see that we will always have kind of like the same shape. So here's question one, question two. The difference is how far left and right they are. All right, so here you can see that the cutoff to go from zero to one is in the positive region. Hmm, okay. And so for someone to be getting a two, we, we, they would need to have a very high uh, you know, latent variable value to, to be most likely to get a two. And go through. And we can see that here it's shifted left. So, you know, we can, if we were to look through the data, we would expect uh, more students on this question to have uh, twos and very few students that have one or zeros, I should say. All right. Well, that's all I've got for you. Take care and goodbye.